message for this morning. Again, I want to thank you, Kathy, because uh, that was that's very important information that we all need to know. And how many of you are impressed with the little model of the Tempe Church? <laughs> that's that's pretty cool. Okay, so this is the great uh, equalizer text, uh, Galatians chapter three and verse twenty-eight. Regardless of our color, we are all one in God. That's the declaration of independence of Jesus Christ, is the way I put it. Today is uh, part one of this uh, series on how to protest the right way. And uh, next week, I want to get more into, I'll share just maybe a couple of things this morning, but next week, I want to get more into the scriptures and protesting examples in the Bible, and also what kind of principles can we learn? Now, next week, when we're talking about protesting, we all have in mind, and you'll see some video and some pictures in a bit, we all have in mind the protests that are going on, uh, that are very, very public. But if you think about it, we all protest to one degree or another. We all protest. And most of our protesting takes place at home. Did you know that? Most of your protesting takes place at home. It could be a child protesting against their chores to be done. It could be a parent protesting their children's stubbornness and refusal to make their bed or to do your homework. It could be things of that nature. It could be one spouse protesting against another spouse certain ideas or certain ways and they're just they're tired of it can be a disagreement we all protest to one degree or another and at the job at work now when i'm saying protest i'm not talking about holding signs up at home and i'm talking about holding signs up at work but we all do this and so I'm using that word protest a little more lightly than what we have been witnessing the last two weeks. In other words, we all are against something or something that's being said, whether it's at home or at work. We all do this, right? We all do this. Siblings with siblings, children on the school playground. Now, I was here first. No, I was here first. They're protesting. So to some degree or another, we all protest. So next week, when we talk about what the Bible says uh, these protests, we can actually see some uh, certain patterns. We can also extract certain principles on the right way to protest and the wrong way to protest on more of a macro scale as to what we're witnessing uh, on the newscasts. Um, even those principles can be applied in these cases. Now, I'm not saying that, um, that all Christians need to go out and hold up signs in public. And, and be activists in this. I'm not saying that. Neither am I saying that we can just remain silent. I'm not saying that either. And so I'm not, I'm not all I'm doing for in this series to, uh, today and next week is promoting Christian principles because really when it gets down to it, it's who you are and how you treat others that is going to make a difference in whether you're listened to or, or not. It's not 100% guaranteed, but, but uh, that's what I want to talk about. Okay, first thing I want to say about these protests is um, that protesters are right. So this morning, I talked about next Sabbath. This morning, I want to just review a lot of the things that we've been seeing, some uh, bad inconsistencies. Um, and the, my purpose for this morning is so that you can see our frail humanity, our brokenness, is really coming to the surface through all of this. Um, our, our, uh, you know, all the things that we are seeing really underscores the fact at how much, and this is going to sound like a cliche, but it's true, how much that this really is a spiritual problem. It's not an economic problem. I'm not saying there's no economic problem. I'm not saying that there's no racial problems, but the real issue, foundational problem behind everything that we're seeing, it is a, an immaterial spiritual problem. It's a, it's a problem with the human spirit, of the human psyche, 
That's the real issue of all that's going on. All of these things that are we are we seeing are that we're seeing are symptomatic of this real underlying problem. And it's a problem in here in the human heart. But uh, I want to say this, that when those in power, I believe that these protesters are right and wrong at the same time. There's some right things happening and there's some wrong things happening. So as far as the protesters being right, when those in power who have derived their powers from those that are governed, abuse of that power in ways that are excessive or corrupt or unethical or harmful or abusive, <clears throat> well, the governed, according to, the, to our Declaration of Independence and even the Constitution, the governed have the right to openly address these issues and protest. This is the right that many people, not just in the United States of America, but many people the world over have a right to do this. It is a democratic form of government. They have the right to openly address these issues and protest. And in this case, as you know, it was certain police officers that used excessive force on George Floyd on Memorial Day in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And unless you live in a cave, and you're shut out from the outside world, you're very aware of what has happened in our country and around the world ever since. Um, this hasn't just affected the United States of America. You see on the screen that there's protests around the world in support of George Floyd. By the way, Edgar, Edgar Solis, just want to make sure that we have the sound on because I'm going to be needing the sound for the video and the uh, videos a little bit later. But here's uh, some examples on the screen in Auckland, New Zealand, and this is all just this past week, almost real time. Um, Monday, um, they're marching towards the U.S. Embassy. All of this has to do with George Floyd. Um, in Berlin, Germany, uh, look at the signs that they have right there. I can't breathe. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, some of these signs here, but that's happening in Berlin, Germany. Uh, the Berlin Wall has a new portrait painted on it, and that's George Floyd himself, and that happened just last Sabbath. I can't breathe, and there's some names, uh, George Floyd, hashtag George Floyd, hashtag I can't breathe, uh, say his, hashtag say his name. The, somebody painted on the Berlin Wall in Germany. This is Copenhagen, Denmark, just this past Sunday. Look at the amount of these protesters. In Paris, France, this is one of the wrong ways to protest, by the way, and I'll mention this more a little bit later, but this happened just this past Tuesday, just a few days ago in Paris, and this in France as well, all of these protesters. This, this has just sparked worldwide protest. This is in Cape Town um, just a few days ago, on Wednesday, June the 3rd. Again, all of this has to do with, with uh, George, I said Lloyd earlier, I meant to say Floyd. This is in Sudan. Uh, it says right here, um, hashtag bl uh, blue for Sudan, black li hashtag black, black lives matter um, there in Sudan. This is in Israel on Tuesday. Again, black lives matter uh, uh, signs, etc. Not in other black lives. This is in Toronto, Canada. This is last Sabbath. This is in Trafalgar Square in the UK. This is on Sunday. And um, in Krakow, Poland, signs, uh, you know, flowers for, uh, as a memorial for George Floyd. And uh, justice for George Floyd is what that, I can't breathe. It's hidden by the flowers, but it says there, I can't breathe. This is in Poland. I mean, it's all over the place. This is in Milan, Italy. I can't breathe. This is what she's saying. Uh, look at this one. This is a video in, uh, from in Denmark. Thousands are protesting. And they're just filling this plaza and what they were called down square, or down square. But all of those protesters, it's just amazing. We're not in a cocoon anymore. Because of social media and our global interconnectedness, everybody knows about this. And people all over the world are, are protesting. Do um, you remember the Arabian or Arab Spring in 2011? You don't know, uh, here's some protest on the back there. This is in Tunisia, where it all started in uh, December 10 of 2011. Uh, December 10, 2010.
ten, I believe, when a man protesting the government's oppression uh, lit himself on fire, and that created just a, a whole wave of protests in the Arabian world against their governments. This one has to be in uh, Tunisia, then it spread towards Libya, and then it spread towards Syria, where there's still a civil war, etc. So the whole world, excuse me, wrong one, the whole world is, um, is experiencing these protests. And I want to show you this in a little bit, a little bit later on. But the whole world is, is protesting. Now, I want to say this, that these protests are a blessing. And that we all have the freedom to protest. Would you say amen to that? Not all, like the, in Tunisia and Libya and Egypt and all of these other places where they have been under uh, oppressive governments for decades. Um, this isn't something that comes natural to that government. They were just fed up. These people were fed up in the Arab world and they started protesting. So our world and our country, our whole world is no stranger to protest, but it is a blessing. Granted that protest can become violent or suppressed, the fact that protesting exists in many governments today is a testament to that government's freedoms given to those citizens. So it is a blessing. In spite of what we have seen, some of the negative things that we've seen on the news today, it is a blessing to be able to protest. Now, in our church context, in the church context, you can protest. Just don't let me know about it, but <laughs> I'm just kidding. But you can protest. If there's something that you disagree with, um, I've had, uh, I don't have it often, but there's been a couple of times where somebody has responded to me saying, you said this in your sermon, what did you mean? Or I didn't quite disagree, that's fine. If there is a disagreement in our church government, which is a representative form of government, we elect our church officers from the world president down to the local president, down to our local elders and deacons and deaconesses, they're elected. Um, but there was a thing that really rocked our church five years ago. You remember that, don't you? Where people protested that, no, this, this certain theological position or practice is wrong. Others were saying, well, no, it's right. And that pretty much rocked the Adventist world five years ago. But how was it done? Were there signs and when there were there fires lit? No, it was done through the channels and people listened. And there was committees set up to address these theological differences and the opposing opinions and viewpoints in our church. There were some protesting, well, that's not right. And some of our Adventist celebrity preachers would express their viewpoints on, on the camera and, and on both sides. And uh, so in the church, the church is not a hierarchy. The church is not a monarchy where I am the king and you do what I say or else. That's not what it's like. And so even in our church, we have, uh, you can address the differences of opinion. And, uh, but again, we're blessed, not all countries. So I just wanted to say that it's a blessing to have, to be able to protest. <clears throat> Earlier I said that there seems to be some inconsistencies in what you're watching on the news. And one of the inconsistencies I'm going to address now is, um, is uh, would probably provoke comment on YouTube once this sermon is, is put up. Either comments uh, disagreeing or agreeing, I don't know. But I just want to state the facts. So I want to state a, a, a something that happened in, uh, in St. Louis. The, the, the black gentleman you just saw is a police chief uh, in St. Louis. And you're going to see him in a little bit. But um, there was another police chief. He was retired. His name is David Dorn, or his name was David Dorn. Anybody hear about this story? His name was David Dorn, 77 years old. He was a retired police chief, but he was working for Lee's Pawn and Jewelry in St. Louis as a security guard. And uh, just this past week, uh, he was working there. It was at night. And uh, some of these protesters slash looters more looters than protesters, um, broke into the store. It was early morning, around 2 o'clock in the morning, and uh, this, uh, this uh, retired St. Louis police captain, he was, he was police captain, not chief, David Dorn, he's black, he's African-American, 77 years old. I saw the surveillance video from, the, from this pawn shop, 
and there's eight uh, individuals, I think one was female, all the others were male coming in, all African American, all of these looters, I'm not saying all looters are African American, but I'm stating the facts in this case. All African Americans came into the Lee's Pond and Jewelry, and the security guard, another African American, was there, and they shot him dead. There was a very, very disturbing video, a live feed of him dying on the sidewalk that somebody had took and another lady was trying to help him. Now, the reason why I say this is because why is there no outcry of this black life? Why is there no outcry of this captain? Because he was not shot by a white person? This is the inconsistency. If black lives really matter, if all lives really matter, and this is why this is a spiritual problem, because black lives, brown lives, yellow lives, white lives matter, but depending on who you are, it'll only matter if you're not stealing or if you're stealing. Apparently, this black life did not matter. What did matter was stealing that television in this pawn shop. It's all on video. Those are the facts of this case, but there's no outcry there. Where are the protests against the looters who did this? A black killing a black. Do all black lives matter? I would say yes. Amen? All black lives matter. All white lives matter. All yellow meaning Asian, and I'm not being stereotypical. I don't mean to be stereotypical, but that's the labels that we use. Brown, me, <laughs> Asian, yellow, black, African-American, or Caribbean, or whatever the case may be, white, Anglo-Saxon, or whatever country, um, Native American, red, brown and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. All lives matter. So there even seems to be some inconsistencies in this. Another inconsistency in this is where things tend to be politicized. This one really, really bothered me. This one bothered me. It's regarding a letter. So I want to share just a little bit of this letter with you. And it has to do with COVID-19. So what Kathy was saying earlier, our nurse, uh, our in-house resident nurse Kathy was saying, is that um, she's talking about COVID-19, how important it is to wear the mask and the social distancing. How do you think COVID-19 is being played out in all of these protests? What do you guys think? What's be is COVID-19 ignoring the people or are the people ignoring COVID-19? Which Don't you think that COVID-19 discriminates who it's going to attack? Yes or no? You mean COVID-19 COVID-19 is no respecter of persons. It is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter what color skin you have. It doesn't matter what political stance you take. It doesn't matter who you are. COVID-19 is going to be a problem when there are large gatherings and everybody's close together. Would you agree with that? I think that is a medical fact, is it not, Kathy? It is a medical fact. Now, let me share this letter with you. Um, I read this from The Atlantic just uh, two days ago. This is Thursday, June 4. Um, and I have all of the, you know, the links on here. Um, hundreds of people in the public health community, so I'm not knocking everybody in the public health, Kathy, <laughs> but hundreds of people in the public health community signed an open letter, first drafted by infectious disease experts at the University of Washington that explicitly counsels an ideological double standard on protests. Now, this letter noted that when heavily armed and predominantly white protesters entered the Michigan State Capitol late last month. So before all of these protests, do you know what the other protest was? Protests against the, the, the states, against the shutdown. You remember seeing those protests? People with signs, you know, uh, we're against uh, tyranny in the governments and open it up and et cetera. There were protests against the shutdown. That's what this is referring to. The letter noted that when, quote, heavily armed and predominantly white protesters, unquote, entered the Michigan State Capitol late last month, quote, this is the letter, infectious disease physicians and public health officials publicly condemned these actions and privately mourned the widening rift between leaders in science and a subset of the communities that they serve. You know, these experts, medical experts, you know what? We're, this is difficult to see. All of these protests going on against the shutdown, most of them being white protesters, um, that's wrong because COVID-19 can spread in those cases. Now, 
Forget public health information. These experts are conveying a public health narrative, a double standard. And here is the letter's most telling passage. So I want you to listen to this carefully. This is the letter I'm quoting. Staying at home, social distancing, and public masking are effective at minimizing the spread of COVID-19. True or false, Kathy? That's true, right? That's true. To the extent possible, we support the application of these public health best practices during demonstrations that call attention to the pervasive lethal force of white supremacy. We support those demonstrations, they say, if it's against white supremacy. However, as public health advocates, we do not condemn these gatherings as risky for COVID-19 transmission. What? It says if COVID-19, I'm the COVID-19 virus, oh, wait a minute, this is a good demonstration. I'm gonna back off. I mean, do viruses talk like that? I'm gonna repeat that last sentence. However, as public health advocates, we do not condemn these gatherings as risky for COVID-19 transmissions. We support them as vital to the national public health and to the threatened health specifically of black people in the United States. Go figure. Now, just about 10 minutes ago, I mentioned that there was an issue in the Adventist church five years ago. Remember that? About women in certain positions in the church. Now, I don't believe I did this. But it's as if me saying, you know what? All of you who are in favor of this theological position, I welcome you. I welcome all of you. Those who aren't, you can go find another church. Did I say that? Right now, as I speak, in this church, there are those who are on opposing sides of the aisle in regards to that issue that was, went to the forefront five years ago at the General Conference session of Seventh-day Adventists. But we don't, and I hope we never do, we don't discriminate based on your beliefs whether you can come to worship or not. We don't do that. You think COVID-19, the virus, is going to discriminate? Well, because these demonstrations are for Black Lives Matter, and these demonstrations are against white supremacy, then the risk of COVID-19 drops automatically because of the political, particular political agenda. Does that sound right to you? That really infuriated me. Now, just to make clear to those who are watching and to those who are here live, I have, I have nothing against uh, the blacks protesting injustices towards them and that black lives matter. I have nothing, I have no problem with that. The problem I have personally is when you elevate one race over another. All lives matter. So when I say all lives matter, I am not saying black lives don't matter because really all of them, no, all lives matter. All lives matter. That is a Christian perspective. This is a Christian perspective. We, do, we cannot polarize and, and, and pretend that COVID-19 is not going to affect one demonstration over another because of the political positions of the people that are demonstrating. Absolutely ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. This is, this is terrible wording. The signatories do not condemn these gatherings as risky, not because the potential risk for disease transmission is lower at the Michigan protest against the state shutdown, but because they are unwilling to criticize an anti-racist gathering no matter how risky it may be. Have you seen that on the news? These demonstrations are not good because COVID-19 is going to spread. Have you, have you heard statements like that on the news regarding these protests? Nobody wants to say that because they're afraid there, there's gonna be a backlash and they're gonna be termed as racist. The fact is COVID-19 will hit you no matter who you are. That's a fact. And this is the inconsistency from the medical group. Again, we cannot bunch the whole medical group together, right? We can't do that. But at least those who team together to write this letter is just absolutely ludicrous. 
I want to show you some wrong ways to protest. Earlier, I specifically stated it is a blessing to protest. It is a right for our country. And if there are some injustices that are being done, as they are, then protests are correct. But there's a right way and there's a wrong way. Let me show you some okay. wrong ways. Listen to but, this. Hey, so, so Volume. I'll, I'll go back to the good news. This is uh, the police chief from St. Louis. And then I'm going to show you the police chief from uh, Richmond, California. I, <laughs> I just thinking about it, I'm tearing up for what they're going to say. But listen to these, listen to these gentlemen. The country. But Volume. Hey, I, so, so I'll, I'll go back to the good news. The good news is that we have some officers that were, that were struck by gunfire. They were standing uh, 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 near, near, near a line, and all of a sudden they felt pain. And so they don't. They they they, they, they didn't hear Talking shots. About police officers and, that were shot. And to fire on people that aren't doing anything. They they're just standing there. So some some coward fired shots at officers, and and now we have four in the hospital. But thankfully and, and thank God, they're alive. They're alive. But I, I you, you, <laughs> what did we, can we make some sense out of this? Can we make some sense out of this? That's all I'm trying to say. Mr. Floyd's death is tragic, but can we make some 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 out of, out of out of something that these kids come down here and just start just start like 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 crazy jumping up and down like 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 that like they're enthused by the jumping, uh, high fiving each other, uh, flourishing pistols, and we and we st as we speak we're trying to get control of the city, as we speak, still here. Police Chief John Hayden, he's frustrated. Uh, he's just, he just, he's, you can see he really got emotional. Um, I have seen so many videos this week. What is unfortunate is that uh, the protesters, we need to be careful in analyzing this whole thing. I think that we need to remember that the bulk, the majority of the protesters are peaceful that the majority of them are peaceful and are not rioters, are not looters, are not vandals. Uh, they're not just uh, trying to take advantage of the situation. A lot of these others that are coming in, they're, as I said earlier, they're hijacking the situation for their advantage to break into stores. I saw a video this week, these two guys driving down in Santa Monica, California. I could not, this is the worst video I've seen. I could not believe it. It's like, I am not kidding. It was like from a Hollywood movie. The anarchy and the absolute chaos in the streets in Santa Monica. I kid you not. People carrying things that they just took stolen from a store and the cops are right there just watching them go by because the, there's so much of this going on, at least in that area. So much, the police can hardly do anything. They're spreading themselves thin. I saw in this one video I'm, I'm just describing right now, a lot of these, and unfortunately, they're in the 20s. All of these young kids are 20-somethings. Breaking, and all mixed colors, <laughs> mixed colors. Grabbing an ATM and pounding the thing to death, trying to get money. And everybody is scattered around and people taking videos and pictures. This has to be on social media. We have to Instagram this live, blah, blah, blah. It's terrible. But some in California, a house was burning. The firemen were called. And this is what this police chief has to say. Of the issues that we're facing. Uh, the mayor mentioned this. Last night, protesters intentionally set a fire to an occupied building on Broad Street. This was not the only occupied building that has been set fire to over the last two days. But they prohibited us from getting on scene. We had to force our way to make a clear path for the fire department. Protesters intercepted that fire apparatus several blocks away with vehicles and blocked that fire department's access to the structure fire. Inside that home was a child. Officers were able to He said inside that house was a child. A burning house. Officers were able to help those people out of the house. We were able to get the fire department there safely. 
Um, sorry. But when you take a, a legitimate issue and hijack it for unknown reasons, that is unacceptable to me, it's unacceptable to the Richmond Police Department, unacceptable to the city of Richmond. As the mayor said, this isn't Richmond. And it truly is. So here's a couple of photos. This happened in Philadelphia City Hall last Sabbath. This is in uh, Washington, D.C., near the White House, just this past Monday, um, and just a looting um, going on. So these are the wrong ways. I want to start finishing up here again. Next week is going to be the second part. A couple of things I want to say before reading uh, a couple of scriptures with you, and then we'll have a word of prayer. The protesting against the police brutality that happened is legitimate. I believe that with all my heart. You've seen the videos. I've seen two different videos, different angles. Um, and I think that it's, it's legitimate. Um, it was excessive force. The poor man was handcuffed, lying on his stomach, and one of the officers who's charged with second degree murder now, the other officers have been charged, not with the same uh, uh, sentence, um, but this particular one that had his knee, um, on the back of his neck or on his, the side of his neck. Um, and even after poor George had died and passed out and died, uh, still had his knee. So this is just completely unacceptable. I was telling my son, they're going to make a law that's called uh, Floyd's Law. I'm sure that's in the up and coming. It's going to be called Floyd's Law, where any restraint around the neck area or chokehold or anything is going to be illegal for the police. Um, there's got to be some kind of law, like Murphy's Law years ago, you know, Murphy's Law, uh, uh, Megan's Law, <laughs> not Murphy's Law, <laughs> Megan's Law, <laughs> the wrong M, um, like Megan's Law uh, years ago. I I'm sure there's going to be a law. So um, this whole presentation, I know it looks like this, but it's on purpose. It looks pro-police enforcement. The protest is right in that brutal force that is excessive is wrong. The difficulty with all of this is when you have an individual that is resisting officers, what are the officers to do? What are the officers to do? Some type of force has to be done. That's just logical. The difficulty is, well, how much force? And of course, you're gonna have certain officers that are gonna break those laws. They've had a bad day, they're stressed out, everybody's protesting, they're angry, they just wanna bash somebody's head in. You're gonna have that, you're gonna have that human factor and it's dangerous. That's why this whole thing is so dangerous. So the protesting against this fact that we all have seen on videos, it is right. But there's a wrong way to do this, such as looting and this and setting things on fire and breaking windows and breaking into stores. That's not the way you protest. So by necessity, because of time, I can't go into this in further detail until next Sabbath. That's the second part. But how are Christians to respond to all of this? Not too long ago, I preached a sermon about submission to government, government remember? This is, a, this is a hot scripture in Romans chapter 13 that is not easy to swallow. I even struggled with it myself. But bottom line, this is what Paul says. The reason why governments exist, the reason why civil authorities exist, is to maintain order and prevent chaos. And Paul says this. If you are going to be in the wrong and do something wrong, then you rightfully should fear the authorities. That's what he says. So as Christians, we should be law-abiding citizens. When there is something that is unjust and oppressive, then we take action and protest, and there are certain ways to do that, which we're gonna talk about next Sabbath. So don't be writing things on the YouTube video in the comment section saying blah, 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 blah. Wait until you hear next Sabbath. But here's a couple of texts I want to share with you. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21 says this. 
repay, these verses are hard to swallow, especially in the context of what we're talking about today. But you got to listen to this. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, if possible, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. That means that we, as God's children, are not to be vigilantes. We are not to take the law into our own hands. The law is not perfect. The system is not perfect. It fails us sometimes. But that is not an excuse for us to go against the law unless man's law directly contradicts what we know to be God's law in this book. Then we go by this and we take the posture that the apostle says, said it is better to obey God rather than men. But that's only when it goes against our religious conscience. We don't use that as an excuse for civil disobedience for anything just because, oh, we don't like the way this person looks or this person's behaving or, or the establishment, etc. We don't use that as an excuse. Again, all of this is easier said than done. I recognize it, but we've got to keep on sticking to this plan, what the Bible is saying here. And God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. If I'm a black man or a Mexican man, or a Korean man, or Native American man, or uh, a white man, and I'm going to go take vengeance against somebody who killed somebody that I love and take the law into my own hands. That's not the thing to do. Tempting as it may be, as Christians, it's not the thing to do. That is what creates chaos in our societies today, is when you're going to do what you're going to want to do. I heard the most ridiculous thing today over the radio as I was driving. I was telling my family about it last night. I was listening to NPR radio, and the interviewer was interviewing somebody in Los Angeles. And the personality was saying, we, what we need to do is do away completely with the LAPD. The Los Angeles Police Department. Another person was saying, and I saw this on a sign in one of these many umpteen videos I saw, defund the police. In fact, in, uh, I don't, maybe it was the Atlantic. It may have been the Atlantic. I even wrote to the girl who wrote this article about defunding the police. Uh, and I, I, wrote, uh, I wrote a letter to the editor regarding that article to defund the police or maybe decrease the defunding. But to defund the police and get rid of the police, that is not the answer. That is not the answer. It's kind of like I have a family. The biggest family here is the Sasek family right here, right? The Sasek family. And there's Sarah right there. And Sarah is consistently throwing her vegetables on the kitchen floor because you hate vegetables. So what's the thing to do? You get rid of her and give her up for adoption. Get rid of her. Or take her, drive out to the desert and leave her out in the desert alone. Just get rid of her. That's the problem. That's the, issue. That's the answer to this problem. Wrong. And Paul says, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It is a vicious circle that evil does. The only way to stop evil in its tract and, uh, and oppression and injustices is you can protest. Yes, and we're going to talk about that next week. But the other thing is to don't take vengeance into your own hands. You know how hard that is to do? All of you, and you and the camera listening to me, we all take vengeance at home. And let me say it this way, because you always want the last word. You always want the last word. You want your way done. Deep down inside, you want your way done. You're going to have the last word. You're going to have things done your way. It's hard to just bite your tongue and to not repay bad to what you perceive bad being done to you. And not just perceive what's bad being bad done to you, but many times there is bad things being done to you. So not everybody's gonna accept this message, but as Christians, I'm talking to Christians, 
You don't repay evil for evil. And the last verse for today, and we'll pray. Proverbs chapter 31, verse 9. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. So as Christians, we are to open your mouth. God says, you better not be silent when silence is just an accomplice to what the injustice is being done. Do not be silent, God says. Open your mouth. Judge righteously. Not by your prejudices, not by your political leanings, but be impartial. Judge righteously. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Racism, injustice is being done. We need to stand up for those people. And open our mouths. Injustice is being done to particular races in our country. In this case, in this context, African Americans, open your mouth. Injustice is being done to police officers because everybody thinks police officers are all evil, they're all oppressive, they're all brutes, and so let's just kill all of them. Then rise up and open your mouth in favor of the police. There's always going to be bad apples in the African community, African American community, like those bad apples that were looters and killed the African American police captain. There's always going to be bad apples in the African American race. There's always going to be bad apples in the Mexican American race of which I am a part of. There's always going to be bad apples in the Hispanic race. There's always going to be bad apples in the white race. There's always going to be bad apples in the Native American race and in the Asian races and whatever races. There's always but we have to fight against the tendency to bunch everybody and say they're all evil or they're all good. Can't do that. Easier said than done. But God has pointed out very powerful principles in scriptures that we should be living by and stick to when the temptation is to polarize ourselves and to start seeing each other with suspicion as Christians know. We've got to keep our moral bearings, folks. Amen? Got to keep those moral bearings. Next Sabbath, we're going to talk about stories from the Bible about protest and what kinds of things we can learn as Christians on processing all of this and what we should do personally at home where protests always begin <laughs> on a lower level. And if there's social activ uh, activism to be done, I think the Bible provides some guidance on that. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord in heaven, we thank you so much for being our creator God and still in control of this world. You saw this coming, God, before it even happened. And we know, God, that you will not force yourself on people. So evil and wrongdoing, the existence of it, is proof, God, that you won't force yourself on people. But God, I think we can all agree in that the person that aches the most, the being that aches the most and is hurting to the core is not a particular human race, but it's you, Father. Seeing your children fighting against one another, hurting each other, making racial slurs, attacking each other, hating one another. This is the devil's playground. and The devil is often in the details, but God, we pray that sanity will prevail. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will work in the hearts and minds of people. And, and even though looters and vandals and killers will continue, please, God, at least put a cap on it somehow. And help us as Christians to be the sane voice in an insane world today. Help us to be lovers of people. Help us not to give up on the human race, but to serve humanity and to share the gospel with people. That is the true need of our societies today. 
that Jesus in the hearts is what will stem the tide of hatred and anger and vengeance and this craziness. Only Jesus can do that, Father. So help us to continue our mission in this world to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. In your holy name we pray. Amen.